Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Whatever time zone you guys are in right now. My name is Katie Boone and I'm the senior marketing specialist for the health sciences certification team here at NSF. I want to thank you for joining in today's webinar where our speakers will be discussing the hidden truths behind supplement labels. First, I'd like to go over some housekeeping notes. Everyone on the call besides the speakers will be muted for the duration of the event. Please use the chat feature on your screen for any questions you have during the call. We will be conducting a Q&A immediately following the slides and will follow up with registrants on any questions that, can be, that cannot be answered during the live session. Today's call is being recorded. All registrants will receive a copy of the slides and a link to the recorded event for their team. There will be polling questions conducted during the live event. Please use your cursor to respond and the results will be displayed just a few moments after the questions are posed. Along with the recording and the slides of the event, registrants will also receive a follow-up survey. Please send us your feedback. We would like to be able to provide more of these educational sessions and your feedback really helps us improve on these messages. We really appreciate your input. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Our first panelist is Martin Krinks. Martin is our Global Business Development Manager for the Health Sciences Division here at NSF. Martin looks after NSF's clients and partners from the dietary supplements industry and sports and trade organizations in Europe and Asia. He is a certified doping prevention counselor and has a background in business and marketing. Martin has been with NSF for seven years now. Also joining us is John Travis. John leads our NSF Certified for Sport Dietary Supplement Certification and Bands Substance Screening Program. He works closely with athletes, athletic leagues, and anti-doping agencies and supplement manufacturers and brands in his role. He has been deeply involved in NSF's sports supplement research and testing programs for more than 25 years. Thank you again for joining us, everyone, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Martin to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I've just had some technical difficulties, but it should be, res be resolved by now. So, yes, hello, everyone, and a warm welcome from my side as well. Um, I would like to start with a quick introduction to NSF, who we are, what we do, and why we do it, before I give the microphone over to John Travis. NSF is an independent public health and safety organization whose central mission is to protect human health. We help people live safer by developing standards and then testing or certifying products to those standards. We also do factory audits for a wide range of industries, and one of them being dietary supplements. Apart from certification, we also provide consulting and training for FDA regulated products. NSF was founded in 1944 at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in the United States. And over the decades, we have grown into a truly global organization with offices and laboratories all over the world. The laboratories where we test dietary supplement products are located in the United States, in Germany, and in China. Now let's get right to the topic. As you all know, we work in a very vibrant and constantly changing industry. We make products that are beneficial for people's health, well-being, and they contribute to disease prevention. But our industry is also struggling to improve its reputation. Over the last few years, there has been a lot of bad press, for example, about the lack of product quality, the lack of safety, about the risks some supplements pose to the general public or also athletes in sports. 
And this creates a big problem because negative news coverage on dietary supplements reduces consumers' purchase intent by 30%. Now, some of you might say, uh, we take quality very seriously, so it's not because of us. But we have to remember, and we have to keep in mind that we are judged as an industry by the worst of us, not the best. So over to Katie again. So if you guys could answer the polling question up on your screen over the next maybe 10 seconds, that'd be greatly appreciated. All right, we got about 60% of people voted, so I'll go ahead and close that and share the results with everyone. Martin, if you'd like to take it from here. Yeah, I was going to say um, um, this is an interesting, interesting, um, interesting result. I guess the answer is also all of these create uh, big <laughs> problems. And I give this over to to John in this case. Good morning, good afternoon. Enough. Thank you, John. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Martin. Good morning, good afternoon, folks. Um, for some reason, it's not letting me advance my slides. Katie, could you please give me control if you can? For some reason, I don't have any option to move it. I apologize for the technical difficulties, everybody. John, is this the slide you wanted up? No, the next one, if you could just move to it. I, For some reason, I've lost the ability to move. Okay, now maybe I have ability now, let's see here. Yes, I do, so thanks for bearing with me, folks. Mm -hmm. I would like to say that adulteration of food products in general and food supplements specifically those food supplements have not been around as long as it's not a new phenomenon let me go back to one slide here katie can you go back to the previous slide please i just don't have control thank you so thank you Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll see if I can. It, it, my the controls aren't showing up for me, Katie. So I'll just prompt ask you to move slides as as I need them. Is that fine? Absolutely. Okay. Very good. It's not a new phenomenon. There's a there was a report that in 1820 by this German chemist named Akum. He was a he had um, immigrated to to um, at the time England and was working for the um, government chemist's office. And he was tasked with um, identifying adulterants in the different food products that were in the markets. And I mean, as you can see, I won't read through them all, but this was this was a phenomenon that was occurring in the 1820s. I mean, things like lead and mercury and cheese, um, sulfuric acid and vinegar, lead, adulterating olive oil. So this is not a new phenomenon. It's been around since the 1820s. Next slide, please, Katie. Again, another instance of it that was reported was um, in this report here, uh, this was a report to the mayor's office in Brussels in the mid 1800s where the government chemists 
in Brussels had had uncovered these um, means of adulteration, whether it's the beans and the, the whole wheat flour and different adulterants and in bread. And it, I guess the operative phase, yeah, go ahead, next, Katie, please. This is gonna give you my um, little thing. The operative phrase is that within this document I found very interesting was adulteration grows as chemistry progresses. So it's been my experience here at NSF as we've investigated different cases of adulteration is that the people who are engaging in that kind of behavior of adulterating, whether it's food or supplements, they are looking to get an economic gain and they understand how the people like myself are using analytical tools to track and uncover the adulteration and the attempt to stay one step ahead of us. So that behavior parallels what happens in the anti-doping world where the athletes know or have a good idea that some of them are very smart and they can read the literature and know how the anti-doping labs are doing their testing and they develop and devise means to try to circumvent that testing. Next slide, please, Katie. So with that, I just did a quick search right when I made this presentation. Um, I just put in the term dietary supplement adulteration. I came up with, as you can see, over 21,000 hits. The first three, um, the one is speaks about adulteration of, of um, food supplement products with phenylethylamines. Um, I, my friend and colleague, um, Rahul Parwar at the FDA, um, SIFSAN had published that study. The next study talking about another issue is um, adulteration of, of oils, whether it's olive oils or things like that. And the third is another hot topic in the supplement industry as well as addition of synthetic drugs, whether it's the um, spice types of cannabinoids, whether it's um, drugs like subutramine and weight loss products, whether it's um, sexual enhancement products that are adulterated with the Viagra, or Levitra, or Cialis. Those are all issues that we face in the supplement industry. Next, please, Katie. So I want to speak, wish to speak about a case, a couple of case studies that we have done over the years. And then I want to talk about the latest publication that I put out with my um, fellow collaborators. And we'll, we'll speak to that in a moment. So one of the first studies that we had done was on this particular product here. I, hopefully everyone has heard about it. But if not, we'll, we'll talk about what was going on here. So this product craze, um, this was back in 2012. So it's what, nine years ago now. Um, it was bodybuilding product of the year. There were, we were asked to do some testing on it because of potential adverse events that were being reported. A clinician had asked us about it. Initially we did the testing and didn't discover on face value, anything that we thought was of note. The clinician came back to us and said, well, can you, can you revisit this and, and take a deeper look at what could potentially be causing these adverse events? Next, please. So if you look at the label here, what, I mean, what, would stick out to you. One thing that really jumped out at us was this dendrobium extract, this, den this trademark dendrobex. I mean, we had not seen anything, I had not observed anything like that in the marketplace. So I was intrigued by it. Next, please. So reviewing the literature, this appeared accurate to me that it should have, if it contained dendrobium extract, it should have those three substances listed there, dendrobine, dendroxamine, and dendramine. Next, please. So I wanted to look at what is dendrobine? That was the one reported in the literature as being the most abundant in the plant. Next. All right, okay, I think I have control of it now. And so we uncovered that dendrobine was an alkaloid in these plants. Um, Interestingly, the it was published. The first pharmacological work on it was published by um, Chen from the Eli Lilly Research Labs. And an interesting note on that is that, from what I know about what was going on with DMA, another supplement adulterate, Chen also later published work on the, the pharmacology of DMA. So he was working on these sympathomimetics in his lab at the time to 
I believe, to attempt to find ways to alleviate nasal congestion, chest congestion. And as, a, as just a, a chemist in general, I think if there's any of you folks on the line, if you look at the structure of dendrobene, it is a very unusual three-dimensional alkaloid structure. Usually things like this in nature are toxic, but it just happens that this one is not quite as toxic and that's what he had uncovered in there. And for the synthetic chemists that are online, this is, seems to be a rite of passage for many of them for, there was a certain period of time where many, um, there were many publications on the synthet synthetic pathways to make this chirally pure substance. So it must have been a, a rite of passage for folks doing that. And those are kind of side notes there, but I found them interesting. So what we did is when we dug further, we went in looking for the chemical signature or its mass in, in this case to see if we could find it. Well, what do you say? It's just a flat line. It's like, wow. So if this allegedly had dendrobium extract in the product, we, there was no evidence of it that we could determine. So dug a little bit deeper, went back and re-examined the label. And we saw these other alkaloids in here, this NN dimethyl beta phenyl ethylamine being one of them. And there was a couple other ones. Well, but let, let's look at this one. This is the one we, fortunately, when we started digging into it, this is one we looked at first. Um, this product, there was, we couldn't find anything in the literature that stated this, this alkaloid was present in, in dendrobium extract. So we went and dug in there and did a repeat the analysis. And we looked at it. Well, lo and behold, we did have a detection signature for this NN diethylphenylethylamine. This is a structure. But we also knew that there could be other isomers as well. Could it have been this isomer? So that was one thing we still had not had not learned yet. So we had to dig a little bit further. The exact mass isn't enough to distinguish the two. So when we dug a little bit further, we did notice this detection signature here. So what we did is we did some additional work and determined that it was the, the N-alpha, which is this substance here. Interesting enough, um, when we reviewed the literature, there is a very little information on it. But one thing we could surmise from looking at the structure is that it was very similar to methamphetamine in, in that it had an alkyl chain, which is a carbon chain at the alpha position which is similar to amphetamine and methamphetamine, and it had an ethyl group off the, the nitrogen substituent, which was, again, similar to methamphetamine. So we, we um, purported that it would have similar effects to methamphetamine in the body. And, and when reading the case studies and observations and folks talking about it on the blogs that were, and forums, that was what was playing out um, in Europe and US and basically across the globe, college students were using this product during study sessions to try to stay up late and cram for studies overnight. They were, they were reporting similar effects to what people had with methamphetamine. And this was being sold over counter as a dietary supplement. It's a huge concern to us. Oops, I jumped ahead of myself there. The other thing is we could find no information that this was a natural constituent of any natural product. Um, we only found three peer reviewed publications on it. Again, I repeat that as an analog of methamphetamine. Um, and in those three publications, there was no safety data reported on its use. So is it a dietary ingredient? Can it be used legally in a dietary supplement? In my opinion, no, but it was still there. So this is one of our first studies on, on adulteration of, of supplements. And again, this compound itself the substance itself was not disclosed on the label. Second study we did was, this one was just a couple of years ago. So we, why do, so I wanna talk about why we do these studies. We, when I embark on these studies, we want to have an impact on public health. So we look, we search the blogs, we follow, the bulletin boards and what people are talking about, which we would consider potentially from a public health perspective, adverse events. 
people saying, well, geez, I took this product and I felt all jacked up. My heart rate was through the roof. Things of that nature we look for because that those are signals that, well, this product may have something other than what is labeled or the ingredient that's in there may have drug-like qualities or may not even be a legal dietary ingredient. So those are some of the whys what we do it. How is we, we also look for the FDA warning letters, for instance, when we did a study on, um, with researchers from the National Center for Natural Products Research in at Oxford, Mississippi. We, we knew that the warning letters out on oxaliferine, so we chose that ingredient to look at it. Um, in this case, we had run across um, a product that had this, this compound called 2-amino isoheptane. Um, just just guessing what that structure is, we knew it was related to um, DMAA and DMBA, which you had published on previously. How we identified the products, we, we um, did just a simple Google engines or Google search engine for the term 2-amino isoheptane. Um, that search only turned up a few products, I believe it was six. We purchased the products and then we, we developed and validated the analytical test method and tested the products to see what, to learn what we could learn from the products. Of the six products, one only had the ingredient that was listed on a label and that really picked our interest. Well, if they didn't have this 2-amino isoheptane in the product, what was being substituted in for it? Now, 2-amino isoheptane itself, we determined it's not a legal dietary ingredient. We could find really no information in the peer-reviewed published literature that purported it was uh, part of any kind of um, food that was sold anywhere in the world. Um, so with that being said, we, we, we dug in and see, well, if it's not too amino acid obtained, not a legal ingredient, what's in there? So we dug through each of the products and lo and behold, so this is just an example of one of the product here. We looked for signals and this signal here happened to be for DMAA. So we knew one of the products had DMAA in them. Um, we went through and we dug through the other products and followed a multitude of other, other things we had studied before, including one that we hadn't published on and we had never detected. So these are the six products that we, we tested in the study. One had the, the 2-amino isoheptane, which is also known by its drug name, octadrine. And then many of them had DMAA or an a isomer or a chemical cousin of, of DMA, the 1,4-DMA. So one, when I say DMAA, I usually mean 1,3-DMA, but there's a chemical cousin to it. And then one of the products even had the 1,3-DMBA, which we also studied in a, and published on previous to this. So that's another case study where we had we specifically look for ingredient that we suspected was an adulterant. In most of the cases, we did not find that ingredient, but we found other adulterants in there. That kind of phenomena and paradigm still exists. Um, with our new study, we had one of the collaborators on the study, Dr. Bastian Fenwies at RIVM in the Netherlands, um, had been involved in an adverse event case on a particular product that was indicative of amphetamine use. Um, told us about it. We said, well, let's look at the ingredients that are on there. This one ingredient, deterinol, was interesting to all of the, the collaborators involved, so we decided to move forward with it. Um, same process as we've done in the past where we use the Google search engine to look for products that contain deterinol, but we also put in names for its other synonyms like isopropyl octopamine or isopropyl norcinephrine. Those are two synonyms for deterinol. Um, we purchased the products of which I believe we were 17 or 27. I, we'll talk about that in a moment. So we purchased the products. Um, we tested the the products with validated um, test method for deterinol. But we also, this time, at the outset, decided to see what else is in these products. What are what other potential stimulants could we identify in them? So the complexity of teasing these signals out of a product 
and this is this is an example of, of what we actually what I actually look at at the instrument when I'm trying to, to determine what's in a product. Teasing these out and knowing what's on the label, what's not on the label is is no mean feat. It's not it's not a trivial endeavor. Each of these products takes quite a bit of time to figure it out. So a couple of things here: you see some innocuous substances like acetylcarnitine, niacin, acetyl tyrosine, caffeine, aspartame. But then you also in this bike see octadrine, which is a signal that stuck out to us. But I mean, just knowing the fragment, there's there's a lot to it. It's not as simple as what you see on the, the TV shows where they introduce something into one of the instruments and five minutes later the printer's spitting out everything that that contains and those those that report is accurate. It's just that's completely unrealistic. So. This table here was not part of the study, but I decided to include it to, to let you people on this um, call know what we actually found in these products. So some of these were not interesting in that they were not real stimulants, but I, I did find it was interesting they were in there. So many of the products, the, all the products that we tested were labeled to claim to Teranol or one of its synonyms. Um, there was a number of products where we didn't even detect the, ter the Teranol. Um, in these products, we we'll like to call it, there's, most of them had a cocktail of stimulants, whether, for instance, if you look at the second product down here, this product here contained a Teranol, contained Vonadrine, which is also known as Fempromethamine. That substance is, uh, is on the water prohibited list, so athletes cannot use that, and it could potentially be sanctioned for use of that in competition in sport. Um, another substance that's on the wild list, BMPEA. Again, this was um, this is was subject to a a um, not an import. Well, yeah, it, it actually it is an import alert into the U.S. as well as the subject of um, some recalls and warning letters within the U.S. Um, in fact, one of our collaborators did a study on BMPEA. I wasn't involved in it. And one of the, the companies that was named in that study actually tried to sue him in court to suppress the publication of scientific knowledge that was not, I mean, it was just facts that he was stating, but this, this brand was trying to suppress the facts and, and essentially bully researchers and not publishing this kind of work in, in support of public health. So that was a very um, frightening time for my, for my collaborator then. Um, this one also had oxaliprine and had a number of other things in them. So these are the, the, the stimulant cocktails that are present in these products. And as you can see, quite a few of them were in there. Almost every product had caffeine. Almost every product had at least one stimulant, if not multiple. We're on to the next polling question, Katie. Give everybody just a couple of seconds to answer the polling question that's up on your screen. Is very, very interesting. I wish I could ask a follow up question to this. <laughs> but we'll move on. I, my, my, my observation looking at this, I don't, I was curious how many athletes are on the line right now. Because I would have guessed athletes would say number two. But Martin, I'm going to turn it over to you now. You're unmuted, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. That, that's really interesting. And I guess we can all agree. Um, it wasn't me. It was the supplements. I guess this is um, 
this is the first reaction that you will hear most of the time, let's say most of the time from athletes um, after they fail a drug test. Now, when this happens, not just the athlete, but also the reputation of the supplement brand can take a serious hit, right? So with sports supplements, the, the quality issues become even more of a news item. And, and the stakes are higher because there are professional sports organizations involved. And for example, a lot of sponsorship money. And as we heard from John, adulteration problems in sports supplements, they, uh, they create a serious problem and, and they range from extremely high to dangerous levels of banned substances. Now we want to make sure that, that both, I mean, the athletes and the brands or manufacturers are safe, right? And, and there, are, there are ways to achieve this. The, the best and safest is third-party certification, such as the certification programs NSF has developed. The first one is NSF content certified. This is a certification that makes sure uh, products are safe for general human consumption. And then we have NSF certified for sport, which is a doping free certification for, for athletes. Certification in general assures that what is written on the product label is also in the product. It indicates that uh, the product is free from harmful contaminants. And it gives extra assurance for, for example, for protein content. Certification creates trust among consumers. It creates safety for athletes by minimizing the risk of inadvertent doping from, from supplements. And last but not least, it improves the reputation of our industry. Now, for all the manufacturers or, or people out there that represent manufacturers and brands, it is it is there are, there are steps that you can implement to uh, to make sure that your brand is protected. For example, it is paramount that um, that you inspect and understand your suppliers, your supply chain, that you conduct your own audits, or you can also mandate audits or certifications by accredited third parties to an appropriate standard. Um, you may want to test your raw ingredients for identity, contamination, and substances. And it is important that um, this, you know, when there is a finding that is, is communicated with others, even your competition, when there's a problem. Only, only when you do this, you can contribute to improving the reputation of our industry. Let's take a look at some uh, key takeaway messages here. Um, let's, for, for, all, for everybody out there who's a consumer, an athlete, or a coach, a dietitian, you want to take any precaution possible in order to minimize the risk of inadvertent doping. Uh, you, may, you want to check um, every product for an independent certification mark uh, before you purchase it. And it is okay to ask the brand, to, uh, if, if there is no certification mark on the product, it is okay to ask the brand whether the product has been tested for substances um, you know, and or label claims, and you can demand proof. And a takeaway message for everybody who's representing a manufacturer or a brand, we have to keep in mind, we are judged as an industry by the worst of us, not the best. It is important that you audit your supply chain personally or through accredited partners. It's, you may want to test your incoming raw ingredients or you can ask a third party to test this for you. Because meeting the regulatory requirements is just the basic minimum. You may want, you, you really want to commit to quality because trust is difficult to win, but very easy to lose. So with that, I give uh, the microphone back to Katie. Thank you, Martin and John, for your help today on this talk. I will be running the question and answer session. We had just a couple of questions come in during the event. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. Um, I believe this would be to both Martin and John. How do you guarantee there are no banned substances in a product. Okay, should I take this one? So th there's never a hundred percent guarantee, right? But uh, with our certification or with, with any you know third party certification, you can make sure that you minimize, you absolutely minimize the risk of inadvertent doping for, for an athlete or minimize the risk that there's a banned substance in the product. 100% guarantee can never be given, but um, but minimizing is, is is very important. John, maybe you want to add something to that? I don't know. Yeah. So 
the testing protocols that we use at the NSF um, have been validated. So by the, what I mean by valid is, which we, I mean we have tested the method for its performance and parameters to tr minimize the risk of a false negative when testing the products, which is of most concern to the brands for their reputation, the athletes who are consuming the product, and the anti-doping agencies and the, the leagues that have to monitor said athletes. So that's how we've devised the methods. That's how we've demonstrated the performance. Within our certification program and our testing protocol, we test for over what 280 plus substances right now across a wide variety, whether it's anabolic steroids, which used for muscle building, stimulants are used to to get somebody up for an event, um, diuretics, which mask drug testing, that's what they're used for, SARMs, selective engine receptor modulators, which are replacements for anabolic steroids that have the muscle building properties, but none of the androgenic side effects like loss of hair, um, and lack of a better word, what they call man boobs, things of, of that nature, and all those different side effects there. So all of those kinds of substances that athletes can't use, that would not only give them a benefit and, and, and a um, edge in competition, but by taking them without advice of a doctor, without being in observation or having that medical condition, puts them at, at serious health risk. Thank you for that answer, John. And Martin, I appreciate that. I have one more question that came in. Roughly what percentage of supplements contain an adulterant or an approved drug ingredient that was added on purpose versus the percentage of those where the brand owner was unaware of the adulterant? Martin, I can take that. Mm -hmm. Well, the supplement industry is a worldwide enormous industry. We have no real good idea of the denominator there. So how many brands are worldwide? We have really built, we just have probably scratched the surface on different adulterations for, for the things that we've studied, the few studies that we've done. I think at NSF we've done six studies and we have a number, number of certified product. But if you could look at the number of certified products we have, which maybe 600, 700, I mean, there have been estimates just in the U.S. alone that there are 55,000 products. I've seen that number throughout. I, I can't, I don't know the veracity of that number, but we're testing certified 600 products um, out of just 55,000 in the U.S. alone. That's not even worldwide. So there, there's no good estimate. I would say that both of those cases, while majority of the supplement industry worldwide is, wants to do the right thing and is trying to, so doing their due diligence will help, will help prevent those things. But there is a segment of the industry, both in the US and worldwide, that just choose not to obey the regulations and intentionally adulterate products, knowingly with drugs. I mean, we see that a lot on in the US where products coming in from, from overseas that are adulterated with sildenafil or Viagra, which is sildenafil or Cialis or any of those um, PD5 inhibitors. We also see that with anabolic steroids as well. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for presenting today and, and our attendees for, or for logging in. I appreciate you uh, dealing with some of our technical difficulties that we had today. Again, I will say that we will be sending out a copy of the presentation for to all those that registered for the event, as well as a recording of the webinar. So please expect that in your mailboxes over the next couple of days. If you have any questions at all, you can reach out to our panelists. Again, those their contact information will be sent in the, the, um, the presentations that are sent to everybody. So please feel free to reach out to them or myself. I want everybody to have a wonderful day and thank you very much for attending our webinar. Thank you, folks. Thank you.